I think the first thing to do before Senator Brock gets here is um, maybe we can walk through the section by section, see what then we can, there's some jurisdictional issues, and then we can walk through Senator Brock's amendment. Would that make, but it's been a little while since we've been through this, so I think it might be helpful. And then committee, we can maybe decide if any of these things, if we can't agree in the findings, I think I'm going to call it quits and go home now. <laughs> so um, let's see where this goes. All right. Okay, great. Maria Royal, Legislative Council. And so I think there were some questions that came up within the last couple of weeks about the state's authority um, with respect to, I think there were three specific issues. One, regulating based on radio frequency emissions. Um, two, the potential for any kind of state appointment moratorium, and these were both in the context of small cell 5G technology. And then the third one was the state's authority with respect to broadband data collection. So maybe go through those. I telecom issues. Um, and issue, jurisdictional issues in particular between the state and the FCC are particularly uh, thorny, to say the least. Um, I'm gonna, I know that you're probably tired. And I'm gonna try to stay out of the weeds as much as possible um, to really winnow this down um, as much as I could, but also try to okay. touch yeah. the main points so that there's some All right. clarity. So with respect to the um, issues pertaining to small cell wireless deployment, under the Telecom Act, there's always been this um, notion of dual jurisdiction in the Communications Act, the major federal law that uh, regulates telecommunications, um, with the state having authority over interstate telecom, the FCC having authority over interstate, um, with respect to wireless services, that cooperative federalism um, is also manifest. And what I mean by that is, on the one hand, there's an effort to facilitate broadband deployment by removing the state's ability to regulate uh, the entry of wireless um, uh, providers into the mar market and removing the ability of the state to regulate the rates of uh, wireless providers. At the same time, there is an effort to preserve state and local authority, particularly with respect to terms and conditions of service, and also more significantly with respect to your question with regard to siting, okay, you know, zoning. Um, however, there are limitations, um, even with respect to uh, the placement, construction, movement, telecom facility, wireless telecom facility siting. And those are the state cannot unreasonably discriminate among providers of functionally equivalent services. The state or local government um, or uh, local subdivision cannot prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting service. And finally, uh, there are other limitations. I'm just hitting on kind of the major ones that are relevant to these discussions. Uh, a state or local authority cannot regulate on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the, to the extent that facilities comply with the FCC standards. So the FCC adopted guidelines in 1996 with respect to what is an acceptable degree of exposure um, have not been updated since then. There have been concerns raised about those standards, and I believe there are, I can't find a docket number, but there have certainly been um, uh, based on secondary sources, uh, uh, many um, political subdivisions interested in, in challenging the FCC to uh, go through the rulemaking process 
and look at those emission standards and determine whether or not they're consistent with um, contemporary scientific data, whether they need it to be expanded to include non-thermal potential effects. The <coughs> main takeaway is that uh, because of this broad preemption provision, there is very little, little that the state can do at this point in okay. time. So we could not say no 5G shall be hung or no preparations for 5G right. shall Correct. be hung. Okay. So, as I understand it, again, our, we do have more broad authority over siting, right? We do. And so right now, if somebody wanted to hang a cell over 50 feet, they would go through a 248A process, is that right? Um, so, so right now, uh, the way that it works, if Act 250 is triggered, it, it's above 50 feet. Act 250? Act 250. Yes. 248A is an option to Act 250. Right. So yeah. you don't automatically go to 248A. Okay. There isn't a, really there isn't a small cell permitted process in statute because that's only an option if you trigger Act 250. My understanding is some of the providers are going through the 248A for small cell employment, but it's, that law predated small cell technology. Okay. So that's how, but the the trip in the point is 50 feet, right? Right. For some process. Right. So would we would there be any problem with us? Um, I don't know if we would say over 10 feet or just say any deployment of a microcell would be required to go through. Process. You could establish a permitting process with all the small cell deployment, as long as it's consistent with the other FCC requirements, kind of timing and so on. Right. You could certainly do that. So um, you tell me we aren't going to do that this evening. Right, and I think there was discussion. Um, I, I think the issue of possibly having a moratorium on deployment until you come up with a permitting process, that might have been one of the that's, topics that yeah. came up. Um, that, I think, would be inconsistent with yeah. the federal requirements, um, because you're basically eliminating the ability of the providers yeah. to enter the market. Um, also, there was a, a recent FCC order in August of last year basically saying, in the FCC's opinion, any such moratorium is preempted under the Communications Act. It's a very clear statement. I should also say, though, that that uh, interpretation is being challenged in the court as well. Most, almost everything I'm saying is being litigated. Um, so that's a, a big qualification. Maria, yeah. there's also a federal issue that if you use citing, and it was in fact shown that the reason that you use citing to do a restriction because of your underlying concerns about health or environmental effects, that too would be preempted. Yes. There is actually a Second Circuit case um, where a local uh, county zoning authority um, going through the permitting process, it became apparent that one of the factors that they considered um, was the possible health effects of a wireless facility. Um, they had two other factors that were perfectly legitimate, uh, but the Second Circuit held if only one factor is related impermissibly to radio frequency emissions, uh, then they are in violation of the federal law. So other circuits um, have been a little bit uh, not so expansive in the preemption. I'm more likely to say if it was the sole factor for denying a permit, um, but in the Second Circuit, it's really, like it's a factor. And I, I assume these aren't 5G permits because we've been told they're only in, is it Chicago and Los Angeles? And I don't remember, but that particular case in um, the Southern District of New York was from 2009. Yeah, so, so it wasn't 5G. Then okay. uh, the other, this issue also, this, you know, with respect to the siting, um, and radio frequency emissions, I think there was a suggestion that perhaps through the state's coal attachment authority that you could impose some requirements. I do not think that's consistent with the Federal Act. 
um, as has been mentioned, Vermont is one of I think, 20 states that have opted out of the federal poll attachment rules. We have a PUC rule 3.700. We uh, regulate rates and terms, but that regulation is really between the attaching entity and the, the poll owner. Um, those rates, terms, and conditions, there isn't within that, you know, reverse preemption provision where the state has control over poll attachments. I don't think that that overcomes the uh, provision of the Communications Act that says you can't regulate based on radio frequent emissions. Okay. So no matter what we do, we can't regulate. They either do any real level or effective level. Now the only case that I could find where there was some form of regulation had to do with more of a consumer protection uh, mandatory disclosures. Um, okay. of cell phone that. providers and, and in the one case that I looked at uh, it was not deemed preempted because it was uh, basically asking the man so phone manufacturer to disclose what they were already required to do under the federal law um, you know what the standards of the federal law are what, there were no additional um, so, so but that was that's about the only thing there are other cases you know what's going to happen in so you said you you had to notify the public that you were putting up a 5G cell. Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think that because that might be considered uh, an unnecessary burden or yeah, expense. No, I, I'm is, saying I, that would be that. Yeah. even that we couldn't do. It's you're you're very constrained. We don't like hearing. I know that. Things. Sorry. Okay. All right. So that, unless the let it cogitate, but I think that's pretty much pulled the rug out of most of the things. I think so. There is, I just, and you know, to be perfectly clear, there is the other avenue, and this is an area that is right for litigation, um, is when the state is acting in a proprietary capacity as opposed to as a regulator. So there was one instance uh, in New York also where a school district entered into a lease agreement with a wireless provider to put a facility on the rooftop of the school. And they required, in the terms of the lease, to have a much lower emission standard than what the FCC required. And there are a number of other issues that came up in the case. But with respect to the authority of this public school um, to require a lower standard, a lower right. threshold, that was upheld by the court, and the reason was because they were acting basically like another consumer, like a, right, in that capacity. And that issue came up in the context of net neutrality, where the state is acting as a consumer, buying internet service like other consumers, and imposing whatever conditions it deems appropriate for the state. I have to also follow that up because in the September FCC order, the declaratory ruling which attempts to establish the legal framework going forward, there is very clear instruction by the FCC that this proprietary scope of state authority um, has been significantly narrowed. I'm sure that's going to be litigated. Um, it's, it's their guidelines, so there isn't a specific case at issue, but the guidelines are that you can't do anything in a proprietary capacity that's going to frustrate or interfere with the federal objectives, and you know, that's okay. Is there any litigation, though, right now that's pending, uh, particularly if it's going to the appellate level, that goes to the issues that concerns have been expressed about here, that we can at least monitor to say, are they reasonably parallel to the kinds of things that we might think about doing? Yeah, so what has... Um, <coughs> So I know the, there's been a challenge to the FCC's ban on state moratoria, so the deployment. That is something that's being litigated. Um, like I said, I believe you know the, the federal uh, RF standards are likely to be litigated um, and looked at more closely. Um, the state's proprietary authority, I'm not sure if the state has taken a position and, and enacted a law that then would most likely be challenged by the providers. I'm not sure that um, I can. Uh, I, well, I think 
We started out trying to do a broadband bill, which we have been told has nothing to do with 5G. I mean, we're trying to find a way to give some comfort to people that are very concerned about 5G. But what I'm hearing is, short of spending a lot of money to go to litigation, with an iffy chance of success, there isn't much we can do. And I would like to get this bill, because on the other side, we've got all kinds of people saying, you know, I need to have broadband. I want to come, I, I, I need to work from home. I, my kids need to do their schoolwork. Um, I need cell service, so if the electricity goes out, I can call 911. Um, so I'd like to keep, see if we can't resolve broadband, put 5G, which it sounds like we are not going to resolve uh, to anyone's satisfaction, and see if we can get that done. So what I've asked Maria to do is kind of just give us a section by section, see where you know we've got um, where we're. we're Comfortable where we're not comfortable, Senator Brock. You can tell us where you, you know, what sections you've got changes coming in, so we can mark those. I've already said that if we can't agree on the findings, I quit and somebody else can take this over. Madam yeah, Chair, sure. can I just ask a yes. question? Um, yes. On the findings. No, on, just before we finish up on 5G, um, and I'm sorry I came in late, and I'm not sure I understand this, but. Several people came up to me and just said, we don't want anything in this bill which uh, promotes, we just want the bill to be neutral. Can we just, can we say that? The bill is I, neutral think we, on? I think actually we may have already said it. Okay. There, there certainly is a provision in my amendment that says Okay, it. so it, it, it is neutral. I mean, this, <laughs> that is not the intent of this bill. This bill is really looking at fiber and it, you know, getting, it may say copper now, it may not by the time we're finished. But it is to get better and some broadband to everybody. It is not my goal to spend any kind of public money on outdated, um, you know, Lots. I, right. I would have a hard time right. feeling justified putting copper out there at, at public expense. So, so on the section one note, yes, we're assuming that these findings be correct, recently accurate. I would assume that Maria did some research on the findings and that they are reasonably accurate. I did. <laughs> well, they are. Okay. Uh, section two. The first section finding, two. I think, is the one that's, the, you know, uh, this came from the Department of Public Service data about who's covered by what speed. And that, that's the only finding that's summarized on the section by section summary. Um, and that's just to give a sense of what the landscape is like currently. So, But that came from the DPS. Okay. Yeah. And that one. <laughs> okay. So then, and so you, you want me to just keep walking through the section by section summary? Is that? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, I'm trying to find my. I've got the wrong bill. That's why it's not. Okay. So the sections two and three pertain to the Vermont Universal Service Fund. Uh, this is the fund that's financed by a 2% charge on the telephone bills, primarily. Um, it raises about $1.5 million annually, and that money goes to specific programs, uh, such as the Lifeline program, which is for low-income assistance, the Relay program, which is for hearing impaired, E911, um, I'm sorry, it doesn't raise 1.5 annually, it raises about $5.8 million annually. Um, I was looking at the rate increase. Okay, I'd like to get my file out of that cabinet, so we're going to need to 
and move the camera. Okay. E911 um, is probably draws absolutely draws the most amount of money from the fund of the 5.8 million dollars raised from the charge. 4.8 million dollars um, has gone to E911. The the rest of the money, and I'm just going doing an overview of current law right now. Right. The rest of the money after all of those programs have been paid for goes into a connectivity fund. And that fund uh, funds two broadband programs, basically, a high cost program and the connectivity initiative. Um, and let me know if you want to go into further detail or because that's sort of the programs that are funded and uh you check and see if you want that produced by given the slippage over the and it was here No, I heard that. <laughs> okay. So the in H five thirteen. Passed by the House is to increase the, the two percent charge by half a percent. Um, so it would be 2.5. And that would be it's estimated uh, that that would raise an additional, at least for next year, 1.5 million dollars. What would the impact be on the average phone bill? Do you know that? Depends on the phone bill. I don't right, know. I'm just so saying the yeah. um, Gosh, I, I read Sam Young actually <laughs> looked at his phone bill and added it up, and I okay maybe a dollar. Or, okay, like I'm not going to find that out. That will be out. So and we'll find no, no, no. I can certainly get that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what the coming is. So of the money that is raised by this point five increase um, up to $120,000 under this proposal would be set aside for a new position within the Department of Public Service uh, for Rural Broadband Technical Assistance Specialist. Um, and that uh, person would be really uh, available to communities who are exploring broadband, their own broadband solutions, whether it's a communications in the district or some other function. So, and it's what? my understanding that that position has been funded in the budget. However, I assume oh. like most other things, that's presuming that we raise the funds. Did, I, I seem to think they just appropriated the money. Yes, they did. But they didn't create the position. Okay. I was but told I it was covered. I'll find out. Yeah. I'll find that out. But that all presumes that we raise the funding, either this way or some other way. So the rest of the money uh, would go to the high cost program and the connectivity initiative as is statutorily required now. And I have red flagged this section assuming that we're going to want to come back and talk about it. Okay. So then the next two sections, section four and section five, um, they are in here for similar reasons. They adjust the speed requirements for uh, eligibility for funding under the high cost program and the connectivity initiative. Right now, under the high cost program, uh, you have to provide speeds that are at least 4-1. The House uh, raised the speed uh, minimum to 25-3 and did the same thing for the connectivity initiative, which is currently set at 10-1. And they raised that, all right. So it's now, for both of those programs, the minimum speed requirements are 25-3. I'm assuming we will have some discussion about the 25-3. Okay. So then sections six and seven, uh, also, with respect to the Universal Service Fund, this has to do with the collection of the surcharge on prepaid wireless telecommunications service. Um, you'll remember that several years ago, when you imposed this surcharge, uh, because there isn't a, a billing me mechanism set up in place for prepaid, 
Um, you chose to impose the fee directly <coughs> on the provider, um, which would be calculated on a formula that the PUC establishes to basically approximate 2% of their revenue that is from prepaid wireless sales <coughs> in Vermont. So that's existing law. That's been in effect since 2014. There was a change in federal law last spring that likely uh, could be interpreted as preempting that collection method. So now uh, the proposal is to go what's known as a point of sale collection method. When you buy prepaid wireless, whether you're getting a card at a Walmart store or other retailer. And this goes into the Amazon, if Verizon is selling cards online. Or wherever it's being sold for a Vermont address, okay. um, you would pay two, the 2% two at the point of sale. And there uh, are requirements on the Department of Taxes, basically come up with uh, any necessary regulations to ensure that the retailers collect and remit to the Department of Taxes and so on. Um, but that is. Can I put a green check next to that one? Complying with federal yeah. law? Okay, good. Okay, green well, check. All right. I believe so. The only expenses that I think that came up had to do with um, the Department of Taxes might incur some more expenses just regulating and enforcing the collection. And I think the number was about five or $600,000, but Department of Taxes did testify in ways and means. Um, I don't think they were, uh, I don't want to speak for the, for the department. There wasn't a major concern. I assume the next section is just allocating the funds that, that so I've got that red flag because it'll get tied with the first. Decision. Yeah, and I should mention the this uh, in section eight, this general fund transfer. Um, so it says fiscal year 2019, and that's how it passed the House. But my understanding is the money is in the big bill, I believe, just talking to JFO, but it's fiscal year uh, 20. Okay. So assuming you want to go forward with any of the appropriations that are in this bill, they would have to be updated to fiscal year 20. Okay, so then put it in. So of that appropriation of $955,000, $700,000 would go to fund grants through a new broadband innovation grant program, um, which is in section 10. And so we'll go through that program, what the requirements and purposes are. 205,000 would go to fund grants through the existing connectivity initiative, so some additional monies into that program, in addition to whatever amount uh, is raised by the 0.5% increase in the universal service charge. And then $50,000 would go to the Department of Public Service uh, to do a feasibility study related to electric companies using their infrastructure Okay, to provide broadband. It's just a study and it's $50,000. Okay. Um, and we'll, each of those will be, uh, well, no, the first and the last one will be revisited in the <coughs> subsequent sections. Section 9 is an appropriation uh, $45,000 to the Think Vermont Innovation <coughs> Initiative, which was established last year in ACCD to support small business growth business growth, growth. This money would specifically be set aside for uh, technical assistance grants for municipalities that are planning broadband projects. Okay. So we need to find out if that money actually is in the big bill. Yeah, and my understanding is that the money is mm -hmm. there consistent with this, just this year 20. So that okay. will confirm that. All right, we will absolutely check yep. just to make sure the money's there. Okay. So with respect to the Broadband Innovation Grant Program, again, uh, this is there's $700,000 available for this program under that prior appropriation. The purpose is to fund feasibility studies related to broadband deployment in rural, unserved, and underserved areas. Um, in terms of eligibility, it's 
pretty broad. It can include a municipality, a nonprofit, a co-op, or a for-profit. And then uh, the conditions for any feasibility study that must be met, you have to be looking at a project that would uh, provide speeds of at least 25 free to potential customers. Um, with the funding, the grant funding under this program, you have to produce an actionable business plan right, to ensure that the product is going to be something useful uh, going forward. Um, grants may not exceed $60,000 each. And then up to two electric distribution utilities are eligible for a grant under this program. Uh, there's finally a, an annual reporting requirement back to the legislature on funding, what's funding, what the status is, and so on. Can we? Section 11 just does that electric company study. study again. Did Do we agree on that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there are some changes to Section 11 in the amendment, but we get to that. Okay. But we, uh, in general concept, the basic we The concept agree. is the same. All right. All right. Section 12, this uh, repeals an existing law that prohibits electric co-ops from using federal funds to engage in non-electric activities, such as broadband. Can we agree on that one? Say that again. There's an existing law that prohibits electric co-ops from receiving federal funds to engage, engage in non-regulated activities. So if the co-op wants to get into the telecom business right now, they're prohibited under current law from receiving federal grants or loans. And that's from the year 2000. To do something that's unregulated. To do something that's unregulated. But they keep making everything unregulated. Good, don't they? Does the Fed tend to make everything unregulated and then you can't I mean, use money yes, to change? Right. I think that the concern may have been more to do with the competition than what they were thinking of yeah, entering into. I'm sorry. Okay. Maybe it's, I, I'd like to hear what you're saying. It's, okay. it's not a bloomer thing. You guys have legitimate stuff to take in. We're trying I, to figure I, out what we might get out of here, so how it's, it's got to it's schedule it's staffing. Isn't the problem with, with them being unregulated is that there isn't any competition? In the, in the telecom industry. So, this, so right now, in Vermont law, electric co-ops have the authority to enter into non-electric activities, be it telecom, um, home heating fuel. <clears throat> However, under the existing law, which was enacted in 2000, there was a provision that they can't accept federal funds to engage in those And activities. I think we heard that okay. there were quite a few federal funds, because we started to ask how other states were funding this, and there was quite a bit of federal funding available. I'm, I'm all for that. I guess I'm wondering, though, if there if could be a need for language that makes it clear that we're not putting rates at risk or right. like the, the, the title kind of says it all. It's a subsidization prohibition. And it would not be my interest to have them do this work in a way that jeopardized rates or had an impact on rates. Yeah. Should we, because I don't see anything in here that makes that clear and I don't know. Okay. That's electric rates, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, that, uh, I, that didn't come up, and they didn't have that language, and we certainly could do that. I mean, I think that's where the, the current law comes from, is electric I think that certainly yeah. is one no. of the concerns, and I think that under the PUC rate regulation, they would have to make sure the accounts for the different services are bifurcated, but yeah. you could certainly add language to clarify that. Okay, but once we add that, can I assume we let them use that money? Okay. All right. Thirteen. So section thirteen. Um, this section uh, basically allows or clarifies 
depending on your interpretation of the statute, uh, municipalities to enter into public-private partnerships with an internet service provider um, such that that provider would actually own, operate, and manage the communications plant, um, which would be financed. Would this be allowing them to join like Central Vermont Fiber, or would this be a private contract with Verizon or Comcast or? Uh, so this would be a contract between a municipality. It could be uh, Central Vermont Fiber could contract with a provider. Okay. Whoever the internet service provider is. Oh, that's right. They're a municipality. They okay. They are a municipality. Yep. Okay. Um, and they can finance the arrangement with revenue bonds, which they're allowed yes. to do. The, the issue was whether could you enter a partnership where the municipality said basically that the ISP would own and manage the communications plant, or does it have to be owned and managed by the municipalities? So, uh, okay, uh, I think we're gonna need to do a little more because then we would be putting public money possibly into building a system for an international, you know, a national carrier that could, yeah, Montpelier could contract with Verizon, provided Verizon owned, but Montpelier would be taking out the revenue bonds or Central Vermont Fiber. Well, there was one, just get speaking to that issue, um, so right now the municipalities can uh, issue revenue bonds right. to build their own communications plans. Um, the qualification that was put in here with respect to if the ISP did own and manage um, it's a private company. They must guarantee the bond and be responsible for any debt service. Okay. So trying to protect potentially. Um, yeah, but having. I mean, it says here the terms of such partnership shall specify. Yeah. Okay. Private internet shall guarantee the bond and shall be responsible for debt service. All right. Uh, section 14. There was discussion in the House about allowing municipalities to uh, have the authority to issue general obligation bonds, non-revenue bonds, not geo bonds, for communications plant um, uh, construction or improvement. Uh, ultimately, though, the, um, they decided to just basically do a study of the issue. So it's the Secretary of Administration in collaboration with the State Treasurer, the Executive Director of the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank, uh, will make a recommendation regarding the use of general obligation bonds by a municipality to finance capital improvements related to communications plan. That reports to the so seven we agree on that one? Yes. yes. Okay. Now we get to the probably the meat of this. So section uh, 15. This establishes a broadband expansion loan program within VEDA, the Vermont Economic Development Authority. These loans are specifically for startup and expansion that enable internet service providers to offer broadband to unserved and underserved locations. Um, in terms of the uh, policies that VEDA needs to establish um, for the program and some of the program parameters. The loan shall not exceed 90% of the project cost. So the 10% by the municipality or other entity needs to be um, invested as well. Each uh, loan, the maximum amount of a loan is $1.8 million. I think you heard testimony about that amount. Um, in terms of who's eligible to receive a loan, again, it's very broad. It could be a municipality, a nonprofit, a co op, or even a for profit. Um, and then, significantly, with respect to this type of loan, the interest and principal may be deferred for up to two years. And I think we heard quite a bit about the loan. I'm going to just put hello, we'll go back to it. I'm watching the clock. I'd like to get to <coughs> Senator Brock's. Oh, and at five, no, it's after five. <laughs> it is my intent 
probably by quarter of six, six o'clock, that we go first to the Ed Bill financing, see if we can get that out of here, and then see where we are on paid family leave, okay. and if we're ready to get that out, okay? All right, so I think we'll just, level yeah, let's move it. Go on. I think we've, we've got a pretty good handle on, we've heard about the bonds at least twice, and okay. we've got, Okay. And they don't seem, everybody seems to like those and they don't seem to be controversial. So we'll go back and look at okay. in detail. No. The poll attachments, I think, are more controversial. Okay. Yes. Um, I, there's a question coming up on this 25 up. And that's one of down the, and yes. Three. That's throughout. I, that's I throughout. It is, and I, I, I have it highlighted. And what, yeah, my, well, I had a technical question. Okay. It, some people were saying that there's nothing wrong with um, 25 down and 3 up if the technology is capable of being upgraded to a, a even 25-25. Okay. Yeah. I don't have the answer now, but um, if it isn't capable, I have one opinion on it. If it is capable, okay. I have a different opinion. We'll have to find a okay. techie that can tell us that. Here. Okay. Note that. Okay. So 16 okay. and 17 all relate to the visa program as well. Yeah. Appropriation and increased moral on the obligation going forward. So sections 1920 poll attachments. Um, so first, uh, the uh, provision requires the Public Utility Commission to revise its existing poll attachment rule to include the following. One touch make ready policies, measures designed to minimize delays and costs, and promote fair and reasonable rates and the rapid resolution of disputes and specifications regarding when a make ready completion period commences and ends. And so uh, it's not very prescriptive about exactly what model one touch make ready completion is, but it needs to address these and um, it requires that the, the final proposed rule must be filed with LCAR on December 1st, 2019. Uh, then the next substantive change related to poll attachments, this is by statute. Um, so these are requirements that would take effect uh, uh, immediately. Um, it requires that, the, again, the poll attachment rule be updated to specify uh, the following. The make ready completion period may not be extended solely because a poll is jointly owned. <coughs> if a poll is jointly owned, the joint owners must notify the applicant which owner is responsible for timely completion of the make ready process and it must allow the attaching entity to hire a qualified, or to be able to hire a qualified contractor to complete make ready work not finished within the completion period. Uh, oh, and one more last page. It requires the poll owners and the attaching entities to submit a list of qualified contractors to the PUC. So that information will be readily available to go to the PUC, get the list, hire the contractor if necessary. Okay. And then we formally authorize that position. And that's the official authorization. And then the technical change there. Can I just ask about the, the ability for the, the attaching entity to do the work themselves or get that contracted? They're, they're, I have a note here, turn this into self-help. And I think that has to do with the lag period of, of right. when that begins. So can you just, so mm -hmm. under this process in the House bill, they have to agree to some time and then if that closes, then the attaching entity can get it going, is that? Can, can hire their own person. Contractor. But is there a sense of how long that lag is or is that to be determined by the rule? Uh, so this just says, if the make ready work is not completed 
within the applicable maker completion period. So that period of time is prescribed in the rule. I don't know exactly what it is, but it doesn't. I think uh, this is where I remember it being pretty uh, long. I think Irv's got the answer for us. Uh, the rule, the PUC rules now on May 30 prescribe a period of time for completion. It depends on the total number of poles to be affected right. relevant as a percentage of that uh, poll owner's total ownership of poles in the state. And the periods are longer if it's a larger percentage of their poles. The new rules change those deadlines slightly. They accelerate them some. But in each case, there's a specified deadline for all any class of make ready that's of a certain scope, a certain total uh, number of poles involved. And this self-help provision would cut in if that period of time has gone by and the poll owners and the other entities attached to the poll haven't done their work, then they would have to refund the money that's been prepaid to do the work. So this satisfies that? that. Yes. yes. So does. Meanwhile, the work's not done. Right. Yes. And there was another. So what happens next? It, it's not. It, well, the work gets done. The work gets done. But yes. if it doesn't get done, no. If it doesn't get done, then the attaching entity does it and gets refunded for that. That's what this says. It's yeah. Yes. But you've got an ex, you've got a period of time, and again, if it's ten poles or it's two thousand, makes a difference. There was a discussion about Maine has put in. Is it a fine? No. But there has, something happened in Maine, and there haven't been any overruns since yeah. They put in a provision of this type. Of this type. Yes, they okay. did. They haven't, nobody's had to invoke it. OK. All right. OK. OK. okay. So that's it. Senator Brock, why don't you? And then I think we've got one other that's coming to us. You, yeah, is this it? Engagement. Nope. Okay. Yep. The one that says draft. Yeah. Okay. Let me just just do a brief opening and then turn it over to Maria to go through the the, the section by section of this. Uh, this is designed to address uh, three things. The first is to uh, uh, address a couple things in uh, the bill that we've just gone through that might need. Uh, that I would suggest that we could perhaps expand uh, to also help us deal with uh, some of the E911 issues that we face. The second thing it does is it deals with the telecommunications plan, the three-year telecommunications plan itself, by providing a little more specificity as to what the plan should contain and what its uh, end result ought to be, and then also to add to the timing issue as to when a three-year telecommunications plan should be ended and completed, which is every three years. Uh, it then looks at uh, the issue that we talked about uh, earlier today, and that is the electromagnetic uh, uh, issue. And there is a study that is being done by the health department, uh, and it makes reference to that study, uh, the results of which are, should be presented on, on the literature, the state of the literature, et cetera, regarding electromagnetic radiation and report back to this committee and our counterpart in the House, but making clear that any reporting done is not for regulatory purpose. Uh, we were quite careful in terms of the language we used to make sure that we didn't run, run into the, the uh, preemption issue, but at the same time to better inform the committee of the full state of, uh, of the literature. And then lastly, there's some provisions going back to E911 uh, to form uh, the E911 board and uh, uh, the rest of us of the state power outages and other things that could affect E911 service. This is preliminary to obviously dealing with the larger issue of service interruption, battery uh, uh, problems with E911 systems. Uh, Simultaneous with this, in open GovOps, uh, the GovOps committee is doing some things uh, preliminary to dealing with E911 governance, uh, starting by asking uh, the uh, administration to come back with a plan for citing the E911 board within government. That went back to us in January and then looking at taking that further. But that's, that's not in this bill. That's in what GovOps is doing. So Senate GovOps? Senate GovOps, yes. 
some point. Okay. So let's okay. start walking through this. Okay. So let's the see where we first go. two instances of amendment are they pertain to section 11, which is the department's feasibility study. Madam Chair, just there are several drafts around the and I 1.6 is the 1.6. Senator, okay, please. I wasn't here. I just no one okay. else was there. I didn't want to be the smart one. You've got the right one. And so I don't know this how This is you a Brock it. you're talking about? Yes. No, I just had one, three, and five. Oh, I have a one point three. Okay. You should have just been handed out a new one that's well, just one point sure. six. I, well, I got two of them, so you have know, I probably have it here. The fact that it's six shows that Senator Brock has not put the grass right. right. under his feet. No. As I said, well, we handed one out last night, and he says, oh, that's about three behind. So, <laughs> we all should have a new one. We all got one yesterday. <laughs> this is new. All right. This is new. This is um, 12, 12 today. So. Okay. Have so Three under this feasibility six. study, Bruh. which is we are doing to the Department of Public Service. Thank you. Yes. All right. So, yeah. So, yes. So these are amendments to the study, the DPS study, and the feasibility of electric companies offering broadband or using their facilities. And so the bold language is what's being proposed to be added. Okay. So included uh, with their study is a determination of a number of things and then also uh, a plan to maintain access to E91 service in any proposed expansion of non-line powered voice service. So this would be the VoIP service. That's, okay. Um, potentially. I know the commissioner would like to speak to this. Sure. I, I think it's a good thing, but I'd like to make sure that a it's possible um, within her within her just facility. staffing and yeah and um, that we have the power to regulate non-line powered voice service could i just ask senator brock I, I totally support what you're doing here but i sort of feel like that's a different um, feasibility study or, or it, it's weird to the, the opening line is shall study the feasibility of my electric company to provide broadband services using electric distribution transport mission infrastructure so I guess I just wonder structurally this if is it should be study. not tacked on to the last paragraph of that study but its own kind of report back and yeah I think so the volume bill has a report back in December Right. And I'm, I'm hoping. When I, I mean, I want yeah. this information. Yeah. We're into style at this yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 I want to know how we structure it. That's good. Okay. Either way, fine. Okay. So, yeah. we, 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 so, can we all be clear that when the recommendation may apply to the report back in December or it may apply to the future uh, planning be. solution? Uh, Giddy up that we're trying to do. We will, we will be okay. as clear as we generally yes. expect other people to be. Okay, got it. And we will <laughs> fail as oh, often as other people <laughs> fail. Okay. I'm usually slow on those connections. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move. So, uh, in addition, as you know, part of the report back, I guess uh, the commissioner, in consultation <clears throat> with the PUC Commission shall define a best practices approach for providing consumer information and conducting community outreach and for providing additional or providing technical and financial assistance to consumers and communities so as to reduce the risk of loss of voice and D91 service during an electric power outage due to the dependency of broadband technologies on the availability of electric power. And shall propose the most cost effective and technologically efficient ways in which broadband providers or alternative entities can provide such information and assistance. Okay. So that's getting the word out. A plan to maintain access. 
I guess I'm not convinced yet that it is possible to always maintain access. It may not always be possible. But an okay. example of the outreach when we when people were talking with us about the fact that their battery power is required in Shrewsbury is an example, but nobody yeah. really knew that, that that was an availability right. or something and that it wasn't should available. be done. And it wasn't readily available yeah. to be able so to do I it. Think so I think that this would re this would create a, a means to ensure that consumers were informed of the problem and how to deal with it. But it doesn't compel any kind of compliance on no. the part. No, 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 at this stage, I mean, yeah. uh, so, this is really a study to figure out, consulting with, to find the best practice approach, and then we take okay, it from I there. Think, I think best practice to maintaining access, yes. because I, I can see you just have to run double lines for everything, but I don't think anyone could afford the phone service yeah, if you did it. So I want to, you know, I think a report on what the best practice is, how other states do it. And there could be and multiple approaches yes. for dealing with depending upon the type of system there right. is. But nobody, I don't think anybody's really fought through this whole no. issue, but our end result is that we have people dialing 911 in Vermont who are not getting through. And they're not getting through for a variety of reasons. And they don't know they're down, not they don't have a battery in their system, or whatever the right. case may be. And I think we just need to have a logical approach that has been well thought out by the professionals of how best to deal with this. Okay. Should, should they consult with any consumer groups? No, we'll, I, I think we'll get to fine tuning the language, okay? I just want us to know what the language is okay. right now. Right. I'm trying to get you out of here before you get hungry. Well. Well. We got to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a long amendment. There's a it lot is. Here. Yeah. That's so amazing. I just want to get through it so we know what it is, and then when we're more awake, we will come back and hash it out. Okay. And and fine tune the wording or move or something else, and we'll hear from anyone else. All right. So we are still on. So same subject. Third instance of amendment. Um, just, just just in the, the loan program, the VITA loan program uh, for eligibility in addition to offering 25-3. Um, you'll see the new language. You have to ensure uh, that the provider has a specific plan and minimize interruptions to E911 access. Um, and in terms of the plan, what it needs to address, technology and equipment, design and engineering, financing, installation, operation, monitoring, Provision of performance and any other parameters of the authority in consultation with DPS shall require to minimize interruptions to access the United Online service. So and is, Maria, could you address the you know the issue of preemption vis-a-vis uh, this issue that 911 is exempt from some of the preemption? It is, well, um, so I think the FCC has itself issued an order related to this very topic and imposes requirements. Um, I think, I believe that the you know, VoIP providers, mm -hmm. um, the internet providers that offer the service, they need to um, <coughs> give uh, customers the option of buying uh, some kind of battery backup that will last for up to eight hours. I think that's going to be extended. I'm not, this, I'm referring to okay, so the So too. there are disclosure yeah. requirements that are required at the yeah. federal level. Um, you know, to the extent that this is consistent with those requirements and don't frustrate them in any way, um, I believe it would be considered a, you know. But this latest design, engineering, financing, installation, operations. Now, if you're asking Comcast to do that, you know, there's a whole technology division, I'm sure. Is this going to ask EC Fiber and Central Vermont Fiber, or once we get up to East Overshoe Fiber to do this same kind of very technical analysis? Well, I think that analysis. is certainly an issue. You know, these are policy choices to make, but if you receive a loan under this program, this is one of the requirements you're being asked. Okay. And then, um, I don't, and I I'm just, that, but. I don't, you know. So we've switched from the December 1 <coughs> report to the VITA now? This is in order to get a VITA loan. You have to so have you, all of these extra requirements. According to Brock. According to Brock. <laughs> according to Brock. The proposed or, 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 or. amendment now begins to focus on areas of VITA monies. 
Yes. Well, in terms of this issue of the requirement, if, if we say that E911 is important, then if we're going to give money to an, in, an entity to create a broadband program, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask, how are you going to ensure that 911 calls get through? Herb, I'm going to have you come up next time. We're just walking through this. Well, I wanted to correct the mistake. Uh, the FCC requires uh, VOIP, voice over IP providers, to, to provide eight hour battery support and offer, for addition, at possible additional cost, the option of buying 24 hour batteries. Okay. That does not help if you're out for three days, which no, the folks in Tewksbury were. It doesn't help you with. Uh, but I, to me, trying to create a fail-safe system, which 911 never was, because even when it was, you know, copper wire only, snowstorms happen, trees fall down, and I don't want to stop or rule people out by asking them to do the kind of engineering or expense that the competition who's already here hasn't had to do. I mean, I'm just, you know, I think I'm trying to balance to fine tune what's being asked for okay. to determine is this reasonable and does it impose an undue okay. burden on, on the provider? Because this is a balancing test. It is, it. yeah. And okay. we can certainly do that. Okay, so let's, so the next instance of number four, for instance, um, had some new sections to the bill, so they're not bold, okay. but these are all new sections. Okay. And as Senator Roth explained, um, this first one uh, updates and amends provisions of the state telecom plan. Okay. And so page four, um, so the plan must provide an overview looking 10 years ahead and then kind of some more specific, or greater specificity about what they need to look at. Um, for example, uh, statewide growth and development as they relate to future requirements for telecom services, including patterns of urban expansion, statewide and service area economic growth, shifts in transportation modes, economic development, technological advances, and other trends and factors that will significantly affect state telecom policy and programs. The overview shall include an economic and demographic forecast sufficient to determine infrastructure investment goals and policies. Okay. Then um, section four, subdivision four on page five um, is related to uh, state, see, uh, state networks and systems, so an assessment uh, with ADS and the Agency of Transportation of state-owned and managed telecom systems and related infrastructure and an evaluation with specific goals and objectives of alternative proposals for upgrading systems to provide the best available and affordable technology for use by state and local government, public safety, educational institutions, community media, nonprofit organizations performing governmental functions, and other community anchor institutions. May include audio systems for uh, playing Farmer's Night in the State House. I was just thinking that. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, page six, this provision related to, um, uh, well, oh, we'll just read it. Uh, a geographically specific assessment of the status, coverage, and capacity of telecom networks and services available throughout Vermont, and a comparison of available services relative to other states, including price and broadband speed, comparisons for key services, and comparisons of the status of technology deployment. Can I, can I ask a question, Maria? I have emailed you the question about whether or not we could require all the entities that own broadband or infrastructure to submit to our GIS mapping. You were wondering if we, you were looking into whether or not we could even ask. 
Is, is that what you're trying to do here? Just trying to get a, a geographically specific assessment? I'm trying, yes, I am trying to get just a, a better understanding of what's covered and where, and also how we compare with other states. You know, as part of this, this roadmap of how well are we doing, well, unless you compare it with something, you never really know. Okay. <clears throat> And I think we've been told to use the state of West Virginia because it's got our topography. It's a topography. It is. Where people live. Senegal has cell phones. Yeah, and No warning water, but they have cell phones. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think the, uh, I've heard the word proprietary information bandied about, you know, when we've talked about telling us what you've got and where it is because then my competition will know. So I, I think we do need to look into well, that. The issue is in the first draft of this, maybe the second or third draft, we, we did have much more specificity in terms of what we were asking folks to tell us about what's on the polls and so mm -hmm. on. We took that out because of the concern that it might well run into proprietary information issues. Okay, but just where you've got a line. Yeah, but you know the the other issue, I guess, is the concern. The, probably the bigger concern is we see uh, providers, cell providers in particular, putting out maps saying this is where we have cell service, and we drive around with our phones in a cardboard box and find so often that it simply isn't true. Right, and that I think is. The, and we're trying to get a better are, handle yeah. on you know are, when yeah. the carriers say that they provide A, B, C, and D, do they? And I think we've heard that other states are looking to us now because that just blocking that the FCC, I think it is, does and designates that there's service there. I think all the folks with boots on the ground know it just doesn't work that way. Except maybe in a flat plat in the Midwest where there's nothing to interrupt, but here it doesn't work. Okay. Yes. It's frustrating when you try to deal with this. Carriers don't have to tell you what's going on, but when they do tell you or represent that something is happening, how do we know it's true? Why? Yeah. Pardon? Well, that's why the department did the drive around last yep. last year to find out how true it was. Was it not sure? It wasn't. Did we weren't being trolled? Right. Was correct. Right. Yes, accurate. that's what they did. So we know that, and we Except know. Simply a very fine print on the bottom of the map saying this may not be accurate in all cases because there may be places on this back and on and on and on and on. Right. Is that the fact it's proprietary? Yeah. No, that one we have. The public one. We have that one. Okay, let's, well, we know we've got some proprietary issues, so let's keep moving here. So six, an assessment of opportunities for shared infrastructure, open access, and neutral host wireless facilities. That is sufficiently specific to guide the PUC, the department, state and local governments, and telecom service companies in the deployment of new technology. An analysis of available options to support the state's access media organizations. Eight, uh, this is specific to emergency communications. An analysis of federal initiatives and requirements. I know there are two specific. Um, initiatives referenced and how those activities can best be integrated with strategies to advance the state's interest in achieving uh, ubiquitous deployment of mobile telecom and broadband service in Vermont. An analysis of alternative strategies to leverage the state's ownership and management of the public rights of way to create opportunities for accelerating the building, build out of fiber, optic broadband, and for increasing network resiliency capacity. Um, then, uh, in terms of the development of the plan, uh, very specifically, the department needs to address each of the state policies and goals and statute and recommend initiatives designed to enhance and make measurable progress with respect to each of those policies and goals, uh, and shall include identification of resources required and potential sources of funding for plan implementation. D, the department shall establish a participatory planning process that includes- I think there is a correction there. Yeah. I believe that we had supposedly changed in C. Instead of uh, the recommendation, uh, we, oh, we- Separate. 
think that was in Yeah, I think it's also in, in the fire too. Yeah. Okay. That basically, no. we're, we're not asking, we're, we're concerned about making the department make a recommendation to us because of the issue that it may be inconsistent, for example, with instructions from an administration designed to cover costs. There, so what we issue. want, we want a report of the alternatives, not necessarily a recommendation okay. of the department. All right. So the, the report of the analysis? Okay. okay. All right. Uh, so in the, uh, the actual process for adoption of the plan, uh, plans, uh, the department consults a variety of people, so it's adding uh, communications union districts. Um, that's in subdivision B. And then page 8, subsection E. Uh, this uh, specifies that there is first a preliminary draft that's published and um, the department must solicit public comment on that preliminary draft. Uh, the department's procedures for soliciting public comment shall include a method for submitting comments electronically. Then after review and consideration of the comments received, the department shall prepare a final draft. And this final draft shall either incorporate public comments received with respect to the preliminary draft or shall include a detailed explanation as to why specific individual comments were not incorporated. Uh, that sounds an awful lot like ELCA. The department shall conduct at least, at least four public hearings across the state on the final draft. Um, consider the testimony. Department shall coordinate with Vermont's access media organizations when planning the public hearings under this subsection. Uh, there's the same requirement um, to have the hearing before the uh, legislative committee's joint hearing. Then, uh, instead of the provisions related to the kind of major review every three years, it now specifies on page nine uh, that the department shall adopt a new plan every three years pursuant to these procedures. Uh, and any new plan shall outline significant deviations from the prior plan. Okay. What, what is the plan being described here? The required to be completed? I think that's coming. So in the next section, it gets a little bit more specific about the, the current plan and, and then the subsequent what the dates are. So that's section 23. It is the intent of the General Assembly that regardless of when the 2017 telecom plan is adopted, a new plan shall be adopted on or before December 1st, 2020 in accordance with the procedures we just went through, subsection B. And then the next plan after that shall be adopted on or before December 1st, 2023. So at that point, it should be every three years going forward. Here's a new plan. Good. So what if we get to 20, December 1st, 18 months from now, whatever, and they don't have a plan? But that's when the capital punishment section comes into play. Do we have any? Uh, interim beatings that take place before we get the I'm, I'm in favor back. of stocks in front of the courthouse with the hands. There are, I, there's another provision here in this paragraph that addresses that to some extent. I think, you, have, you know, it's frustrating, but there is a separation of powers and we do not have ultimate power. Short of so we're dependent on the goodwill of the department to have a plan to, to meet the goal point. that we've established. We do have the purse strings. Right, and if we don't give them the resources and the people and the capacity that's to actually do this, then I mean, it, then that's it's right. just empty. And so that's, I, right. that's my frustration is that we are asking them to do more and more and more. We're not giving them more capacity to do it. And it's not fair. Well, this it's is, actually this is the it sets them up for paragraph. failure. Okay, we got the next paragraph and we did get them more money. At least we're trying. We did get them more we are trying. So subsection B on page 10, if at any time it becomes apparent to the Commissioner of Public Service that the department lacks the time or the resources to comply with the requirements of the section, the Commissioner shall submit a report to the General Assembly on what additional resources or time are necessary. Mm -hmm. That report shall be submitted prior 
to the adoption date and with sufficient time to allow for any needed legislative action prior to the adoption date. And the report may include a proposal for contracting with an outside entity to prepare the plan or a portion thereof. And if so, shall include a suggested funding amount and source. Okay. The idea is that the plan year begins on January 1. Uh, presumably, while the legislature is in session, the department should be able to assess whether or not it's got the capability, the time, or the resources to do the plan. If they don't, they have to come to the General Assembly and make a request for whatever resources are necessary to contract with someone else in order to get this done on time. That's, I, so as they far as I know, that's a fact. They would come back to the General Assembly. While we're in session that year. You know, so we need money. So, and, and then it's up to us to act to either provide it or not provide it. But that way we don't get to the end of the year, find there's no plan, and then ask what to find there weren't resources. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Second we're just going through this. Right. We're going to give the commissioner a chance to comment and then... We have lost our drafter on family leave, so we will do that first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, my intent is we will stay here to get out Ed funding. When you say first thing? Nine o'clock. So. No, I've already talked no, to you. I've already, already talked to right, I've sent him a note. No, but we have a meeting at 8.30, so I don't We have a meeting at 8.30, and they know we're meeting at 9. Okay. Yeah. Um, Our committee's canceled for tomorrow. Okay. Well, I'm just trying no, to. No, I'm. 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 i it's, it's worry about that when we get done today. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Oh, and tomorrow we're going to have to do net metering 101 probably first thing. I've lost it. Okay. <laughs> we'll try and get that lined up too so we're prepared to, when we go into that committee of conference. All right. Okay. Back to this topic. Senator Brown already spoke about this. Uh, this is a report by the Commissioner of Health on possible health consequences from exposure to radio frequency fields produced by wireless technologies, including cellular telephones and FCC regulated transmitters. We're going through a summary of available scientific data as well as a comparison of what various emission standards and guidelines. And then the uh, statement that the Senator alluded to earlier, the purpose of this report is to provide policymakers and the general public information deemed significant by many Vermonters. It is not intended that the information gathered in the report be used to form the basis of policies that are inconsistent with federal law. <coughs> okay. What does that leave us? <laughs> Knowledge, but no action. No exciting. Yeah, you said you did clear this and they are doing Stuff. Yeah, the, the, the health department is doing something, yes. Okay, so we are, they're doing it. We're just taking credit. All right, I'm trying to work out tomorrow. Section agenda. 25, uh, this re concerns reporting of tower outages to the B911 board. Um, and basically requires the board to adopt a rule. Um, requiring uh, void providers to report to the board within two hours, any outage in a system such that more than 10 subscribers lose the capacity to make a 911 call, um, outage for purposes of this section is any loss of 911 calling capacity, whether caused by a lack of function, the subscriber's backup power equipment, lack of function within the provider system or by any other factor, external to the provider system, including an outage in the electric power system, then that's with respect to the ISP. Then in addition, the rule shall require every electric company to report to the board any network-wide power outage affecting more than one service location within two hours of notice of the outage or as soon as practical. Uh, and then a deadline for filing the proposed rule to LPAR February 1st of next year. And then subsection B are, um, uh, these would actually, similar requirements, but they would take effect though 
30 days after the effective date of this section. Um, these are temporary standards and procedures. The idea being until the final rules are adopted, there would still be some requirements. The, the two hours, uh, we did modify that to uh, notice of the outage or as soon as practical because as we talked with some of the municipal utilities, they don't necessarily mean 24 hour or they learn about it from alignment and don't have the capability to get it in me, which is why we added the, the, the as soon as practical language. The purpose of this is really just to collect information you don't now have about the frequency of outages that may affect. So this is kind of the first step in what to do about it. That's next year. It's out. It's no, we voted it, but Bobby moved it to us on the floor today after we voted it. Is that may, true? Yeah. It physically came here yesterday. It physically came here yet? Fine. We'll move we, to a Don't tell anybody. We'll move it to a Because <laughs> there's no one looking. <laughs> yeah. okay. you here. Are you sure you didn't move it to a Oh. I thought he moved, maybe he did that. I thought he moved it to finance. He can't move it to a pro because did you take it up? Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe he's moved it to a pro. All right. Yeah, we're, we're, clean. Done. we're done with it. We're done. All right. I'm trying to figure out how we get the rest of these bills done. Okay. All right. It'll be on the website if you can. We're moving. Okay. So this this section here, 25, says that when coverage goes down, within two hours, some people are notified that there's no longer coverage, right? Not the people. Not the people. E some, some, E911. Yeah. 911 knows that they've got a problem up in East Overshoot. No, the they don't. The problem is isn't solved. But right. right now, we don't have a centralized place where all this power outage stuff is even collected. So the first step of figuring out how to solve the problem is to get an idea of what the extent of the problem is. And right now, we right. don't know. Yeah. So this is yeah. the first of a two-part problem uh, solution. Right. Well, about 2,365 days ago, and plus two hours, we were notified that the coverage coast stuff went down, and it's still okay, bad. but all right. That was then. This is now. Well, and I, some of us want to go home. Well, I would like to. Okay. I, I have an like amendment that tries to deal with the coverage code before we start the mandate in the future that we have to learn something within right. two hours when we don't do anything when we... Where, where is your amendment? I'm going to... Maria's going to... Okay, but I haven't got that scheduled because no one told me you had the menu. So we will do that when we get to this. I told the commissioner That's fine. That's that fine. she can um, make some comments if she'd like now, and then we're going to go vote out the Ed bill. All right. I, I want to. Then Senator Brock has worked hard on this, and these things are all okay. Yeah, which Senator Brock is well, we can't the prime mover on can't change the past, on, on we can solving that problem last right. summer about a year ago. We can we can't change the past. Yeah. We can try and make sure it does not happen again in the future. All right. Closer to the door. And maybe the department has already figured out how to do that, so we will move forward. Commissioner, well, thank you, Dean Chair and Commissioner Department of Public Service. Thank you so much for having me in on such short notice. Um, I'll try to keep it very brief um, and to the point based on the um, discussion I just heard. Um, I recognize in Senator Brock's um, amendment proposal that uh, there is a desire to revisit how we plan for telecommunications. And I also am fully cognizant, certainly based on my um, nomination vote that there is displeasure with the product that my agency has so far generated, or at least that's what I assume the above reflects. I have tried to find out. Happy to speak with any senator who wants to talk to you about that. Um, I would urge the committee to um, slow this down a little bit. I've spoken with Senator Brock about this. I think that a plan to be effective should have good buy-in. And um, this committee has not had enough time to take testimony robustly from all stakeholders who don't have to buy it. You're talking you know, now about the telecommunications plan? Specifically, the amendments that would change okay. the telecommunications planning process. Um, there are also other elements in the amendments that um, are similarly affecting that practice center. Um, for instance, the um, proposed amendment about the battery tax, uh, I too was aware of the problems uh, that they've added. Shrewsbury, and as I think the committee is aware, 
um, my department petitioned PUC for an investigation of this battery pack issue, and that investigation is underway as we speak. Uh, the amendment proposes that I do this work in consultation with PUC, but in my opinion, you have a process in place now where the PUC leads that kind of investigation. The department is participating in that, and I think that is a measured way to go about achieving what you want to do. That is where a technical record can be developed about these things. Uh, it will be done appropriately cognizant of the jurisdictional limitations that we have on the issue. We do have to remain mindful, as uh, Ms. Royale pointed out, that battery packs and the like are regulated by the FCC. And we're talking about backup for services not strictly committed to state jurisdiction. So this is the kind of, this is why this body created the PUC, and I would strongly urge you to look to their uh, their expertise and process in terms of their ability to be substantive experts on the matter in order to help with these practices that you're talking about. Recognizing, though, that in the end we can't compel adherence to best practices. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you, you could legislate it down this way, but now you have parallel processes. You have the PUC doing an investigation, and you have me consulting with them about something that they're investigating. And that, to my mind, um, risks an overcommitment of resources that are scarce. Okay. That's an example of the kind of thing. Yeah, that another thing I would, would comment yeah. on is that for the past four days, we've been consulting with your director of policy and plans, who has seen this draft, and this is the first we've heard yes. of this. I was a leader during the survey. Well, again, the, the fact that your department and your key person would not have provided the information that there's a PUC investigation that, that's being done, that any part of this would conflict is just amazing to me. Well, sir, I'm happy to discuss this with you at a point of time. I, I, I can't sit here today. Okay. I'm just pointing out that there is a process underway. I, the well, I got a notice. I thought people did about the Shrewsbury thing and that there had been a request to open a docket. Yeah, in fact, mm -hmm. there's okay. to that effect. So it may just be that I got a copy, but I did know that there was something going on. The senator's point is that my person has been dealing with him, and clearly there has not been a good closure. Yeah, okay. well, he, in fact, has been consulting with the draft of the bill. Understood. Okay. And he's supportive. Exactly. Yeah, okay. all right. So there made some comments back to the department that have been incorporated here, but this was not one of them, nor was it even mentioned. Okay, but they, if time goes on, people, things percolate. And I, I, it might be more helpful, Commissioner, if you could just give us some written comments and we could, or specifics that you would like to see changed in the bill, um, you know, alternative mm -hmm. suggestions. I think we're trying to come up with a, you know, a telecom plan that is meaningful this and, is my point. I'm okay. not sure that, that to do that, it would be better to have a process this summer where you have the senator and others interested, and the department and other stakeholders to participate in designing what that telecom statute for planning should look like, as opposed to doing it in this way, where there's been very little stakeholder input, certainly not through testimony. I'm not aware of what other stakeholders, for instance, have been telling you about what can and cannot be done. Well, the committee knows nothing, so. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> we have not been involved in the process at all. So I, I, I think that we're trying to find a way to move us forward to have an effective plan in a timely fashion. I think we recognize that you have been short staffed and that we have a responsibility to make sure that you have adequate staffing to do what we expect you to do. Um, Madam Chair, fair enough, and so there's really only one other point I would make tonight on that very point. Um, to the extent that the USF um, charge is increased, the new revenues 
500 to 600,000 of those revenues will be newly consumed by the tax department to administer the point of sale for this project. <coughs> so it's not as much money as you think is coming in. Okay, the, 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 the tax gross. department will yes. get most of that to money. To administer the, the fact that they now have to regulate point of, sa of sale collections of that tax <coughs> oh. because of the change of federal law that is really all. The thing with the cards. Oh, okay. We just heard the opposite. No. Maria said that no one objected to the. No, no one objected. No one is the objecting. Money. I'm just pointing it oh. out that, that we. No one objects if they get the money. No, there is no objection. Maria, Maria, Maria has come from personally a similar tax here. Okay. Yes. Second of all, the bill, I don't think it requires that that those personnel additional costs will come from universal service companies. Right. So whether they're. I think we just need to know what the needs are. Precisely, and, and similarly, when, when we were talking earlier about how we're getting them new money, uh, it's, it's important to point out that that new money, if indeed it materializes through an increase in the gross receipts tax or in the fee bill, it is needed to pay for existing expenses. Right. We already have an $800,000 deficit this year. So as Senator Bell was pointing out, these new um, obligations, which are valid and good things to do, are things that are going to have to be done above and beyond what we're already doing with resources that are short. And I just wanted to so we need aware to, of we need, if, we may need to decide, because we've got two major studies in here. Precisely. One is the uh, electric co-ops and electric companies. Precisely. That is one. And then the other is a new telecom plan. Precisely. And we want that telecom plan by next year. We want it in 18 months. We are going to have to start immediately, and that might as well give you notice right now and we're going to need more resources. Okay. I'm not in a position to identify for that. For the very reason that okay, I think th that would be helpful if yeah. you went back and talked to your folks um, and found out what you might need um, and how long things would take and we can figure out then what our what realistic expectations might be along with any way we might find a raise some money. And the last thought I would leave with you with tonight is many of the initiatives in H five thirteen are outgrowths of proposals the department made based on the telecom plan that we prepared and given to you today. Right. So the present plan has generated a work product that I'm proud of and it is reflecting the fact that we have made a significant support in the building and it's going to find its way to I think we have come to realize that riding around with telephones in a box is actually an important study sure. and yeah. As, is getting us some national recognition or appreciation. And, um, you know, despite when we started saying, okay, um, it, it, unfortunately, sometimes that's the only way to do it. Very primitive and hands-on. Okay, yeah, I will let you just go through it, write us some comments or make some edits that you would like to see. The committee's just heard this for the first time. So we're, this is Senator Brock's proposal. I'm, I've got another one coming from at least one, maybe two from Senator McDonald. Um, and we'll take those all under consideration. And I would again, I would compliment Senator Brock on the direction and the ideas and the It really is question of how and where. I think we all want to go in the same direction. I don't think anyone wants people not being able to get 911 service. I'm less sure we have an easy fix to it, but we can start. I'm assuming I'm excused. You're excused. Thank you, Thank you very much. Anyone can walk with you. Okay, committee, we're going to do the Ed Bill, and then you can.